Okay, let me get started. I'll give you the premise. The premise is the issues are not AV related. The issues are that my laptop, where I was up till 4 a.m. last night writing this talk, did not boot at all. And as a consequence of that, my notes that I spent quite a bit of time putting together are not available to you. But I am still on the hook to keep you entertained for 30 minutes. So we're going to see what I can live code off the top of my head on my secondary device, which has a really terrible keyboard. <laughs> this is like the worst keyboard in the world. What I can do to keep you entertained for 30 minutes, because that's what I promised you. I actually promised you 45 minutes. But at least you can excuse me the 30 minutes. Unfortunately, it's not the talk that I had presented to you. Probably that's going to happen at a future event once I can actually get that laptop to boot. The notes are stuck. Bear in mind, this is sometimes you know, these kind of Byzantine errors. I do a 90-minute seminar every week, and you never know what kind of Baroque or Byzantine error can occur in the middle of one of these things. That's why it's important to be prepared. Whatever the case may be, this talk is titled, How Can I Keep You Entertained for 30 Minutes? We're at Pi Data London 2022. It's Ju Sunday, June 19th, 2022, I believe. My name is James Powell. If you like this talk, I don't know what's wrong with you, but you can follow me on Twitter at don't use this code. Uh, and we do, of course, seminars every, every week. We do corporate training as well. So if you're interested in what we're, we have to talk about, feel free to sign up for that. This will also be a demonstration of how well I can speak and teach extemporaneously on a topic with zero, literally zero preparation on what is honestly probably the worst keyboard you have ever seen. So here's what we're here to talk about. We are all some sort of data focused or data scientist. And as a consequence of that, we see that there are tools that we may use every single day, tools like Pandas or X-Ray or Matplotlib or NumPy. And it's the case that we may very quickly discover that, you know what, we don't really need to know that much about Python in order to use these tools. In fact, really, what is there to Python but, say, function calls, right? There's basically function calls and variable names and then API calls. And so if we take a look at what's available in something like Pandas, we might say, well, Pandas is just memorized set access and rename and set index and things like that with no coherence behind it. Hopefully, using this terrible laptop with a terrible keyboard, I'll be able to give a lightning talk in a couple of minutes to show you where that coherence is. But fundamentally, the programming language that's provided to you, Python, is not just function calls and variables. There's way more richness to it. I'll give you an example of that. And this is something that I'm surprised never really comes up, even though it is such a useful tool. If you think about the dichotomy between, say, lazy and eager computation, and you think about things which Python programmers tell you about all the time, but it goes in one ear and out the other, like, hey, aren't generators really cool? Who cares? Well, the reason that nobody cares is generally the dichotomy between lazy and eager computation is one talking about the amount of time of two different aspects of your code, either the amount of time of some incremental operation or the amount of time to decide whether to do the entirety of that computation. And when you talk about lazy computation, it's usually because the incremental time to do one step tends to be significantly greater than the time to decide. This is where generators come up with. But what you're more familiar with as a data scientist is tools like NumPy and Pandas, which are strictly eager computation tools. They're in fact, oftentimes fully in memory tools. Everything is right there. You perform a computation, and it gets done immediately. And the reason why things like generators never come up is because in a tool like that, the time to do an incremental computation is significantly less than the time to decide whether to do the next computation. For example, in a NumPy and DRA, it is sometimes faster to perform extra operations and simply throw them away than to make a choice. So you will discover if you have a NumPy and DRA, that using something like numpy.where or even doing some sort of indexing, like if you have an array with some values and you index like this, and then you take each value and you increment by one, this will actually oftentimes be a margin slower than if you just say, well, x is equals, you know, x is plus one on every single element times a mask of x is less than zero plus x is times a mask of x is greater than zero. That'll actually be faster doing more work. And this is a little bit perplexing, but this also tells us why it is that, for example, data scientists do not seem to care about lazy computational mechanisms outside of, say, when it reaches a certain level, like the Dask level. They don't care about the simple tool right in front of them, the generator. 
If you think about it, what is a generator? A generator is a way for you to use an out-of-band encoding in order to express the stages, the steps, the portions of a computation. So what you're saying is, this computation has multiple parts associated with it. If you really think about it, something like a function can do multiple things in it. You know, if you have some input data in this function, you can perform a bunch of different computations. You can say data plus one, data times two, data, uh, maybe to the third power, that, that times key is really hard to hit. And there's actually three things that you're doing here. But the interpreter can't see that, and you're not delineating that in any fashion. This is like some sort of data, like a, a string which has commas in it, where you're not saying, oh, this is where this entity exists, this is where this entity exists, and these have these delimited. There's clearly three steps here, but you're not providing any information to the interpreter to indicate that. And with the generator, all you're really doing is taking the same computation, and you're saying, you know what, I'm going to make it clear where each step begins and ends, and where each logical step begins and ends, because obviously the interpreter can already see where each bytecode begins and ends, and obviously, you know, with things like the global interpreter lock, it will lock to, or lock the interpreter to the execution of a single bytecode. Well, if you look at something like this, this is the same operation as above, the same computation, the same three things are being computed, but we've split it up into parts. This is why this is such a useful tool for lazy com computation. What you're doing is taking a large computation, breaking it down into parts, and saying, this part, this part, and this part can be run independently, and in between you can decide if you want to keep running. So, if it's the case that the time for the incremental step is much larger than the time for the choice to keep going, the time to decide whether you want to take your generator instance and ask it, do I want the next value? If that choice <coughs> tends to be faster than the choice of the incremental computation, then that's what you want in a generator, which means that there's probably a lot of data science code out there, especially any sort of library, that really isn't written in an appropriate way because if you think about it, this generalizes to any large-scale, non-closed form operation where the incremental computation is slow. For example, a simulation. Think about a simulation. In a simulation, you may take some input data, a NumPy ND array, an X-ray data array, or, for example, a data frame of some sort. And what you're going to do, you can do some sequence of very complex operations. And if those complex operations take more than about a microsecond, then the time to re-enter the Python interpreter is going to be really negligible. If that operation takes a nanosecond, like it's a single integer add, then the time to re-enter the Python interpreter will be so high that you just want to do this eagerly, you'll do it all in memory, you'll just blast down those values and you'll see that it'll be the, fa the fastest approach. But in the case where you have a simulation, where each incremental step of that simulation is expensive, which is not uncommon, think about operations on a very large matrix. Those are expensive, they may take time. There may even be operations that are multi-stage that require going out to external data, where it may be the case that one step of the simulation is a second long. Well, this simulation should be modeled as a generator. The reason that you want to model as a generator is you can then rele release a certain presumption that you have about how you've modeled this. Think about any time you have some sort of simulation. When you have a simulation, you have to decide what the API for that simulation is. And you have to decide between a lot of choices, like, do I run the simulation for a certain number of steps? Do I run the simulation until I hit a certain threshold? Do I run the simulation for a certain amount of clock time? And you encode that in the API for the simulation because you say, well, you know what? I don't want to run extra work. I don't want to do extra work. I don't want to run this for 10 seconds if I only need to hit a certain threshold. I only want to run it for five seconds. And you allow the user to control that externally via this API. But this is the wrong thing to do because the generator says, I don't care how long you want to run this computation. You decide how long you want to run this computation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to delineate the steps of it. And after each step, I'm going to ask you, do you want to keep going or not? And then externally to this, with a much, much simplified API, you control how you want to run this computation via mechanisms like iter tools iSlice, or iter tools take while, or some custom generator you can write yourself, like you could write one that is a very soft time counter like this, you know, time dot some generator here, and you say this is it takes the start. I'm actually kind of getting used to this keyboard. <laughs> uh, and then you say, you know, something like 4x in G. And if you're if you over if you go over your benchmark time, then you stop. Otherwise, you yield x. Well, this is something that, for whatever reason, I think is a consequence of 
a lot of data scientists, they look at the code, they look at their APIs that they know, they memorize the APIs, and they forget that there's an entire language behind it, an entire language for modeling these things. And they see repetition in their code. And when they see repetition in their code, their only tool is the very fundamental basic structures they have. Let me just write a function, package things up to a function, where they could choose a much more appropriate tool, for example, a generator, subject to meeting that criteria of the incremental time for the computation being significantly larger than the time to re-enter the Python loop to decide whether to keep going. And what happens when they do that is, instead of writing one function or three functions with this extremely complex API, they write one representation of the simulation, which presumes none of these modalities at all, thus allowing the end user of this thing to arbitrarily decide how I want to start or stop this computation, including modalities which you could not foresee. For example, run this simulation for 1,000 steps or until it hits a threshold value, or a brand new one, like until the incremental improvement is under a certain threshold value. Think about it. Whenever you write a function and you presume these kind of modalities, especially where a computation starts or stops, you're making assumptions about where an end user wants to start and stop that computation. And you're almost certainly going to be wrong, because if you think these are the only three ways you can do this, you're absolutely wrong. Somebody's going to say, look, we don't want to keep running this computation as long as there's no extra benefit. So that's another modal parameter. And the APIs will sprawl and sprawl and sprawl. Let me show you another example of this. It is very, very common when you take a look at data scientist code, that there seems to be a high tolerance for repetition, and the only mechanism for limiting that repetition is the function. Let me pause for a second and ask you a question. When do you write a function? No, 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 let me ask you another question. When do you not write a function? This is something that I'm very surprised that a lot of data scientists don't really have a good sense of, because they have these habits of, oh, anytime I have repetition, I'll write a function. They never really revisit that and say, well, hold on a second. If I'm making an affirmative choice to do something, then there should be some corresponding decision-making process under which I should not do that. When do you not write a function? When you see repetition in your code, when do you not write a function? Have you ever considered that? Well, it's actually fairly clear when that situation is. If you think about it, the desire to write a function is usually the desire to eliminate an update anomaly. In other words, if you have some sequence of scripts, some sequence of knowledge, and you see you know, a repeated operation, FGH and then FGH over and over, and you say, that's very repetitive. Let me eliminate that repetition. Let me write a function. Well, the question that you should really be asking yourself is, is that repetitive intentionally or is that repetitive coincidentally? Why could it be repetitive intentionally? For example, these represent the one true canonical way to operate some process. For example, if you're working at a secure classified site, there are certain processes that you must follow. You must always follow those processes. And you can see those processes replicated throughout the code base. You may want to establish a single source of truth for how to do these processes, such that if a change occurs to this process, it occurs in one place, and that change is reflected in all instantiations and all manifestations of that. But it could also be the case that this is very coincidental. It just happens to be the case at this one point in time that these are the same. And where you see this a lot is with data loading. Anytime you see deep in a library somebody doing something like this with open file name as F, and they process this file name, there's probably something that's going to go wrong later. Namely, Whenever you think about it, any time you interact with the outside world, your interaction with the outside world is not constrained on your time schedule. In other words, I'm loading some data that you provide to me. You decide tomorrow, I'm going to give you a CSV file instead of a JSON file. What am I going to do? My code just broke. I'm going to now postpone all the activities that I have planned for the week. I'm going to work through the weekend to solve this. Interaction with the outside world is one of these very large sources of churn because the outside world changes and you have to respond to it and re react to it. Similarly, where it changes, you often have this desire to introduce a modality. So for example, somebody wrote this function f in order to perhaps load some data from this file. Maybe this is a json.load on this. And they decided to package up a little bit more than that. Maybe they did some processing on this data to get some result. And they said, well, you know what? I'll put this into a function because I see these two lines of code or these three lines of code occur throughout my code base. People open the file, and maybe they do some data cleaning on the data, and then they, then they do some processing on the data, and I don't want to have my data scientist cutting and pasting this all the time. 
But what they don't really think about is, maybe it's the case that just at this one singular point in time, those four lines of code are being repeated, and maybe it's the case that those four lines of code should retain the ability to verge over time. For example, if one of these users wants to eliminate outliers, then you would think, oh, okay, I write, a, write another line in this function. And when the other user says, no, 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 I didn't want to eliminate outliers, I wanted to include them, then you say, oh, you know what? I add a modality here, with or outliers equals false. And I add a flag, and I say, if outliers, or if not outliers, then something like that. And what you can think is, whenever you in accidentally reify repetition, every time you write a function where you shouldn't write a function, the general pattern that you'll see is you'll start adding flags and modes because the end use case, the manifestations of this, will start to diverge over time. One person wants to remove outliers. One person wants the file to skip the first line. One person wants it to be a CSV file. One person wants it to be a gzip CSV file. And it adds flag and flag and flag and flag and flag. And as a consequence of that, the code just falls out of control. There's no way to test this thing. You're churning this function all the time. Well, this is a consequence of you reaching for that habit of writing a function without really thinking, is this coincidental repetition or is this intentional repetition? Is there an update anomaly in play? I use that term at the very beginning of this portion of this very ad hoc talk, and the analogy that I want to share with you is this. When you think about a database, and you think about database normalization, the reason why we do database normalization is to eliminate certain anomalies. In other words, when I update a field here, that fact is changed everywhere through the database. Everybody has experienced this themselves. You buy a flight, you change your seat on the website, you check your boarding pass on the mobile app, the seat hasn't changed. You call them up and say, well, I just got upgraded, why, why isn't my seat changed? They say, oh, we have two databases, it hasn't flowed through yet. And you say, oh, that's very stupid, you should have one single source of truth. That's what a function is, a one single source of truth. The purpose of it is the elimination of these update anomalies, and if it's the case that those facts are allowed to diverge, then you're actually unifying things in such a way that you will then cause sprawl, you'll cause modalities later. Ultimately, the intentionality of writing a function really should be focused on that. Repetition, ad hoc behavior, is in fact generally okay to do. It's okay because it preserves your ability to continue to change and to have these pieces of code change over time independently of each other. And really think about it. If you had some sort of data loading deep in a library that you were providing to another analytical user and you changed the way the data loading worked, how do you test that that doesn't blow up your other users? How do you test that the consequences of this aren't going to affect somebody all the way over here? But if you had that data loading, that interaction with the outside world at the most superficial part of your code, maybe all the way at that if name equals main block, then you change it to one place and nobody else is affected. You can tangibly and, and very, very directly feel the distinctions between these, but we have this habit of writing functions. Now, the next thing that I wanted to share with you is maybe a, another bad habit that we have, and it's related to, uh, do I want to talk about loading functions? I already talked about loading functions. Oh. I'll talk about ad hoc behavior. One of the other things that I think we sometimes don't, don't encourage our data science colleagues to do enough of is to think about Python in terms of certain patterns or certain conventions, certain habits that we see the standard library move towards that we should encounter in our own work. One example that I like to use is, if you think about the iter tools module, you can think about the iter tools module in a very, very, uh, superficial fashion. You can think it gives you things like combinatorics, like the ability to create C Cartesian products, or combinations, or permutations. You can think about it in terms of very simplistic things like generalizations of concrete mechanisms. For example, iSlice is a generalization of slicing on concrete data. iSlice is the same idea as slicing, but on non-concrete data. But when you think about these, and you think about these in terms of things like zip and enumerate, what you're missing here when you look at the superficial details, is there's a general pattern here, and a pattern of iteration helpers. The idea that whenever you're doing some sort of iteration, especially in Python, you're usually trying to encode some process that a human being probably cares about. In other words, if you really think about your data science code, and you think about where loops show up in your data science code, it's often the case that loops don't show up at the computational side. For example, you don't loop over each element of the NumPy and DRA manually to add one to them. You push that computation to the restricted computation domain, you push it deep into the C or Fortran layer in order to do this efficiently, because it's the only way you're guaranteed to be able to do it efficiently. And so, if you have some, let's see if I can get you some random data, numpy.random, 
default RNG. See, I even put, took the effort of doing this properly. So here you go, size equals three by three. And if you wanted to do some computation on this, you'd say, okay, excess plus one. You wouldn't do the looping over each of the elements. But where you'd see some of that looping is, well, actually, at the human level, not at the machine level, not at the data level, I want to represent the idea that I'm doing three different scenarios. So my scenarios may look like this. Scenario one, or scenario A, I add one. Scenario B, I add two, and so forth and so on. You might even use a Python dictionary in order to model these. And you'd have some loop that says for the name of the scenario and the uh, adjustment, you do some sort of loop. Ooh, that's really hard. There we go. And you do something like this, x is plus, or here, you have your data out here maybe, and then you kind of plus the adjustment. And so typically where you see these kind of looping, you're trying to express some human intention. Go through each scenario and do this. And where you don't see the looping is typically where we want to express some computational operation. Oh, actually go through each individualized element and add one to it. Well, when you think about this, what are these iteration helpers all about? The iteration helpers are usually about surfacing modalities, making it so that the choices that you might make along the way with the iteration are visible to the end user in that for loop block. And so, for example, if you think about things like enumerate, the purpose of enumerate is to tell you where, where you are in the iteration. Am I at the beginning of the iteration? I'm at the end of the iteration. You may have seen in past, in some of these talks, I've written some of my own iteration helpers, like from iter tools, we can pull in I slice and T, and we can write our friendly NWISE helper. And you know the, tra the, the, the talk is more or less going back on track when I start writing NWISE, because this has come up many times before, but you do something like this. I think you I slice G from I to none for I, G in enumerate T, G, N. Oh, got one more here. And then, you know, you can even do things like writing NY's longest, which use a zip longest. And this allows you to write something, which I don't know that I'll be able to write for you, uh, which is last. But I can show you first, and that's pretty easy. Here, let's do repeat and chain. And what you can see here is I'm writing iteration helpers, not for the purpose of showing off what I'm able to write on a terrible keyboard live in front of you, but instead for the purpose of showing you that these are small little tools that are quite helpful for exposing your intentionality and for improving your code and for convincing your colleagues to improve their code beyond what they're capable of doing. So for example, you write an iteration helper like first that takes some generator like this, and it does something like repeats, say the value true, n times, repeats the value false forever, chains those together and zips it with some generator or some iterable to be more precise. And what you can think is, the purpose of this is to allow you to write code like this for first x in, or for is first x in first, oh, that's horrible. And it doesn't help that it's really nervous when you do the, when these things are done off the top of your head, something like this. You can actually identify what mode you're in. You can identify if you're the first value. In fact, it turns out that things like last are very easy to write. So if I had the time, I'd probably write something like this for you, where you can do something like identify the first element and the last element of an iteration. And remember, you're not doing this in order to support the underlying computation. You're doing this in order to support the intentionality and the human intentionality and the ability for you to express at the ad hoc level, at the for loop level, oh, this is the first step of the simulation I'm looking at. This is the last step of the simulation I'm looking at. These are all the other steps of the simulation I'm looking at. In essence, what we can see from this, and I think we're nearing the amount of time that we had, what can we see from this? We can see that number one, it is very, very difficult to put together a coherent talk with no notes, live coding, with no plan ahead of what you were gonna talk about in 30 minutes. Number two, I hope I've succeeded at it, but number three, a very important lesson. When you take a look at what Python provides you and you think about it as, oh, it's so easy, it doesn't have contravariance and covariance like Java, oh, it's so easy, it doesn't have template metaprogramming like C++. Well, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily a tool that you can use so superficially, so readily. It means that this is a tool that has a certain richness and a certain uh, set of approaches and tools that if you just try to shrug your shoulders and say, oh, 
I know the NumPy API, I know the Pandas API, what more is there? It's just a bunch of function calls and keyword arguments. You're missing an enormous amount of what you can do effectively in your code. Simple mechanisms like generators should show up more in our code. They should show up any time we have some sort of simulation or some sort of non-closed form operation where the incremental step is large enough that we can actually pay the cost of going back into Python to decide where they keep going. Mechanisms like functions are not the habits that we just want to write. Anytime we see repetition, write a function. We should be thinking about these things with a little more depth because I know for certain you have some colleague who started writing code in Python, maybe a modeler, maybe a scientist of some sort, and they learn functions and then everything is now in a function with a million arguments and it falls out of just, it, you, you just lose your ability to maintain this code because the keyword arguments keep getting added on and on and on. And they never really think to themselves, why am I doing this in the first place? We should really be thinking a little bit deeper about why we choose to use even the most basic tools we have. And when we look at Python and we see things in the standard library, or if we see things in the built-ins like, like enumerate or zip, or we see things like iter tools, we should look a little bit beyond the superficial details of what they appear to offer to us and really see what is the convention, what is the intentionality here, what is the goal here. Because largely, it is the case that these are tools that are provided to help us write better code. Not better code in the form of faster code, but better code in the form of code that exposes our intentionality, exposes the choices that we may make that may later on change, that we want to be very reactive to being able to change later on, that makes it possible for us to write code that put some structuring around the core computation. Now, with that said, I hope I was able to entertain you. Uh, I think we're just at the time that we have. Thank you, everybody. I'm James Powell. Hopefully, I'll be able to give the real talk at some future point.